We are up to mitzvah number 92, which is the prohibition against cooking milk and meat together. And today we'll do mitzvah number 92 and mitzvah number 113, which is a related mitzvah, to not eat nor derive benefit from milk and meat that was cooked together. So we have three different prohibitions. Number one, mitzvah number 92, not to cook the milk and meat together, even if you're not going to consume it. And then mitzvah number 112, I'm sorry, and mitzvah number 113 is A, not to eat the cooked milk and meat together, and B, not to derive benefit from the cooked milk and meat together. Now the Talmud tells us that there is a verse that appears three times in the Torah, Lo sevashel gedib chalevimo, do not cook a kid, a small goat, in its mother's milk. So that's the mixture of milk and meat. And because this verse appears three times in the Torah, it's telling us the three prohibitions of milk and meat. Number one, not to cook it together. Number two, not to consume, even if someone else cooks it. And number three, not to derive any benefit from a mixture of milk and meat. Now, interestingly, in the delineation of 613 mitzvahs, we have two mitzvahs, even though there are three distinct prohibitions, with mitzvah number 92 and mitzvah number 113, which combines the prohibition against consumption and deriving of any benefit. The Sefer Chinuch, the book that we are using to navigate through the 613 mitzvahs, spends a lot of time in mitzvah number 113 to explain why we need three verses, but we only have two and not three mitzvahs in the counting of the 613. But again, we're going to try to give a little snapshot. So I don't get so much into the inside baseball, into the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty of, of exactly why it's two prohibitions and not three, even though there are three distinct aspects of this idea. We want to give a snapshot. And I'll tell you that with respect to milk and meat and all the laws that flow out of this prohibition, people spend months and months studying and there are books, thick, really thick books that talk all about all the possible considerations. But again, we try to, we try to cover here like in you know, 20 minutes or a half hour, get a snapshot. But it's important to always remember that this is just a picture. This is just a snapshot. This is just a small window into a much bigger subject that we could spend a lot more time discussing at length. So the Sefer Chinuch begins by just explaining the basics. You know, the verse tells us, don't cook a kid, a small goat, in its mother's milk. It seems to be much more narrowly focused than the actual law, which is not just the meat of a small goat, any meat of a cow, of a bovine, of a sheep, any meat in any milk, not just the milk of that particular animal's mother. So the Sefer explains that the term Gedi, which means a kid, a baby goat, that is a generic term for any meat, and he brings a proof. Elsewhere it says Gedi Izim, and that specifies goat, and therefore when it says Gedi without any attribution, without any specification, that is a reference to any kind of meat. And similarly, just like the meat part of the mixture can be any kind of meat, so to the milk kind, so to the milk portion of the mixture can be any kind of milk for it to be part of this prohibition. And the reason why it says don't cook a kid in its mother's milk, it's just that was simply the most common way to do it. That's the most, you know, the, the most common liquid that you may have around, but the prohibition extends to any milk or any dairy product to use that as the base for cooking the meat would be a violation of this mitzvah, consumption of the product would be a violation of the prohibition against consumption of milk and meat, and you would not be allowed to benefit from that, even if you're not consuming it, to benefit in some other way, that would also be a prohibition. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the law. We have mitzvah number 92, to not cook it, even if you're not benefiting from it directly, you're not consuming it, you're cooking it for someone else, that would be a prohibition, and we have mitzvah number 113, referring to eating and benefiting, there is a prohibition against consumption and benefiting from milk and meat together.
So let's go through some of the laws before we try to understand what the principal idea here is. So again, as we mentioned, there is a prohibition between cooking. There is a prohibition against cooking even if someone does not consume. So to be a line cook in a non-kosher establishment that has milk or meat, provided that indeed qualifies as halachic milk and meat, that would be a prohibition. Now, there is a difference between this prohibition against consumption of forbidden food and all other forbidden foods. Let me explain. Normally, the things that are prohibited to eat, there's a certain format of consumption that you eat it and you enjoy it and you consume it the normal, ordinary way that food is consumed. If you're going to consume something in an unusual fashion, that might be a workaround against some of the prohibited foods that we cannot consume. Whereas by milk and meat, even if there is no benefit, there's no enjoyment. So for example, the food's piping hot and you consume it and you don't chew it, you don't taste it, you don't enjoy it, it burns your throat. Nevertheless, that would be a prohibition of this mitzvah against consumption of milk and meat, even though ordinarily that would not qualify as a form of consumption that would, that would indeed have the full weight of the prohibition. Now, interestingly, from a biblical perspective, the problem with milk and meat is only when the milk is kosher and the meat's kosher independently. It's the mixture that's the problem. And this is one of the mitzvahs that we'll see that is a prohibited mixture of two independently okay things. The milk is kosher. It comes from a kosher animal. The meat is kosher. The meat comes from a kosher animal. It's just that the union of the two is the problem. So, for example, what if you have meat from a non-kosher animal or milk from a non-kosher animal? That would not qualify, at least on a biblical sense, because the rabbinic laws, there's lots of rabbinic edicts and decrees on top of the original biblical law. But from a biblical perspective, just the, the baseline of the law, if you have a non-kosher animal or non-kosher meat, if you have a non if you if you have non-kosher meat or non-kosher milk, then that would not qualify as the prohibition of milk and meat. Now, in addition, from a biblical perspective, this is referring only to domesticated animals. So a deer, venison, venison's kosher. It's got the split hooves, it chews its cut, it qualifies as a kosher animal. But because it is what's called a chaya, not a behema, not basar, just these are the Hebrew terms for domesticated versus undomesticated animals, because it is a non-domesticated animal, it would not qualify as part of the biblical prohibition against milk and meat. And similarly, fowl and poultry, these are not considered animals, this is poultry, different, a different classification, they would not qualify biblically as part of the meat that would render, uh, that would be part of this general category of milk and meat. Now, from a rabbinic perspective, the rabbis made a lot of decrees on top of the original law, and that's why poultry and milk is a big no-no, and venison and milk is also a big no-no, but there are differences. Primarily, chiefly, that you can cook and benefit from it, even though you cannot consume it. So we have certain areas of the law are extended to those parts or to those animals that are not part of the biblical law, but not everything is extended. And the Sefer Chinuch, and this is a theme that appears throughout all the literature, he stresses that it's really hard to differentiate between poultry and, let's say, turkey. If you have a a beef burger and a turkey burger and a chicken burger, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference. And therefore, if you were to mix milk and meat, 
you know, put a piece of cheese on your turkey burger to the innocent bystander, to the onlooker, it seems like you're mixing milk and meat, and therefore something which appears to be a violation of the Torah law, the rabbis very frequently would come and say, let's extend the biblical law with a rabbinic edict in order to prevent copycatters, in, in order to prevent people to misinterpret what's happening, and they may come to say, well, look, the rabbi's eating the milk and the meat together, it must be, it is okay. No, even turkey burgers, even church chicken burgers, even poultry, fowl of all types, is extended that you cannot consume that together with milk. Now, what difference is there? This is, this is just an example of, of how far-reaching these laws are. What difference is there that you can benefit from certain things, even though you cannot consume them? So a very common question people have is pet food. If it's biblically prohibited to benefit from a certain concoction of milk and meat, you cannot benefit by giving it to your pet. That would be benefiting. Even if you're not consuming it yourself, you're not cooking it yourself, but you are benefiting from it. And therefore, if it is part of the category of things that you cannot consume, but you can indeed benefit from, that would be an example of something that you can give to your pets. Okay, so um, let's go through some of the other laws here. Because there is such an emphasis on the separation of the dairy, the milk, and the meat, the sages enacted the following decree. And this is both for meat, which is biblically prohibited to be mixed with milk, and for fowl, which is only rabbinically prohibited. There is a restriction against consumption of dairy products and of meat products on the same table. So suppose one kid's having a hot dog and the other kid's having a piece of pizza. You gotta put them on separate tables. Or at a minimum, one of them is on a tablecloth and you pull up a tablecloth and the other one's on the, on the table itself. There's a distinction in the table between the part of the table that there's the consumption of the milk and the part of the table that there is the consumption of the meat. And again, this is a very unique situation in that this is a decree on top of a decree. Why? Because fowl, poultry, and milk, well, that's a rabbinic decree. And here we have a double decree. There is, not only is there a concern of, of the poultry and the milk, but there's an additional decree to put them on separate tables or at least in separate table cloths in order to prevent any sort of encroachment from one upon the other. In addition, and again, we're running through some of the laws here just to give the picture, the overall picture of what is included in this mitzvah. In addition, the sages enacted a waiting period, a cooling off period. Now, the exact length of this period is a subject of different customs. It's anywhere from one hour to six hours after the consumption of meat and poultry before the consumption of any dairy. So if you have a barbecue and you are observant of these laws, you would wait six hours or five hours or three hours or five and a half hours or one hour, different customs, before you have your ice cream. And the idea is, is that the meat potentially leaves residue in your mouth. Maybe there's some pieces of meat stuck to your teeth and it takes a while for that to be cleansed out. And therefore the rabbis instituted a waiting period after the consumption of meat, before the consumption of dairy. Now, it doesn't work the other way around. So if you have dairy, immediately you can have meat, but if you have meat, you cannot immediately have dairy. And again, this is part of the rabbinic extensions of this law. From the biblical perspective, it's only when they're cooked together. Come along the rabbis and they say, well, there's a concern of some sort of residual leftovers of your hot dog, your steak, in your teeth or in your mouth. And therefore, it's a problem to consume milk or milk products afterwards. But vice versa, if you have your ice cream, if you have your pizza, you can go right afterwards to consume your meat provided that, you know, the custom is to have, let's say, a drink of water or even wait five minutes or something like that, but something negligible 
to make sure that there's actually nothing left over from the ice cream or dairy products. This, by the way, gives term to a phenomenon called flashigitis. Have you ever heard of this term? So the Yiddish term for meat is fleisch or flesh. And fleshig is when someone is under the restrictions because they have consumed meat. So for six hours after the consumption of meat, the way it was always described back in Europe, that person is quote unquote fleshig, meaning they're under the restrictions of someone who has recently consumed meat. So if you're worried that there's going to be like an appearance of an ice cream truck or someone's going to show up with chocolate you don't want to be flacious. You don't want to be under the restrictions of being someone who recently consumed meat, and therefore there's a flacious itis, where you see something, it looks really nice, a stew, it's something you want to nibble on leftovers or something like that, but you have flacious itis, you're terrified, what's going to be when I want the chocolate, when I want the M&Ms, when I want the ice cream, that's a problem. I, I don't want to take any chances. I don't want to put myself under the six-hour moratorium. Again, this is, uh, there's a lot of ancillary discussion around this, but that is another component of this law. Another idea here, and this is very big, a very big subject, but we're going to cover it in a minute. There's the concept of 160th negligibility, meaning suppose you have your beef stew and for whatever reason, you're drinking your coffee and a drop of the milk or the milk that was in the coffee drips into your beef stew. What now? You have cooked milk and meat together. So there is a general principle called 160th negligibility. That if there is a component of a mixture that is smaller than a 60th, so one unit out of 60, and that becomes negligible in most cases. In, for example, with chametz, there's no negligibility. So a tiniest drop of chametz is going to disqualify an entire vat of something which is kosher for Pesach. But with respect to milk and meat, if you have a drop of meat falling into, let's say, a, a, a milky, a dairy pot, or vice versa, with more than or fewer than a 60th of the encroaching either dairy or milk, it becomes negligible and the pot and all its contents can still be consumed. But again, there's a whole cascading list of laws of all the different scenarios and all the different permutations of this. But that's another general principle in this particular law. Now listen to this. What about almond milk? The commentaries talk about almond milk because almond milk, it looks like milk. It's easily confusable with milk, but it is not milk. It's not dairy. So there's an interesting law that tells us that, if, that you can, in fact, cook meat in almond milk. However, because there's the concern of someone else seeing it and misinterpreting what's happening over here, you have to make sure that there are olives around it. I'm sorry, you have, to make sure that, you have to make sure that there are almonds around, either in the mixture or next to the mixture, in a way that makes it evident that this is almond milk and not regular, ordinary milk. Another general aspect of this particular mitzvah is the idea of what happens to a pot when milk or meat was cooked in it. So there is a principle, so there is a principle that states that when you cook something, heat, it, can, it, it changes the status of the vessel in which something was cooked. Meaning, because there is food in a given pot, the heat is going to transfer some of that food into the walls of the pot, and that can be expelled, that can be excreted, so to speak, the next time that there is heat introduced to that environment. Meaning, if you have a brand new pot, it has no status. The second you put the meat stew in it, now that pot becomes a meaty pot. And therefore, if you were to cook dairy in that same pot, part of the 
residue, the leftover taste and experience of the meat that was cooked there previously is going to be expelled into the dairy, and that's a problem. And therefore, you have to separate your pots. You're going to have the milk and the dairy pots, and you'll have the meat and the meaty pots, and they should never be used for the other kind. Now, incidentally, glass, Tama tells us, is non-porous. And therefore, glass is the one material that can be used interchangeably. It can be used for milk and meat because nothing is absorbed in the walls of a glass vessel. Now, stainless steel, we know scientifically that, stain, that stainless steel is non-porous. And someone once told me, and I'm somewhat dubious of this, someone once told me that when Messiah comes, the first thing the Messiah is going to say is that stainless steel is non-porous, and therefore you can use it for both milk and meat. And of course, in the, Tal in the Talmud's times, there was no stainless steel, and therefore we cannot carve out an exception ourselves. But Messiah is going to come, and that's the first thing they're going to declare. Get off the boat, get off the plane, get off the donkey, and say, well, I have a big announcement. Stainless steel is non-porous. You can use it interchangeably for milk and meat. I'm dubious. I think there may be some other things that Messiah want, will want to declare. First, we'll have to wait and see. Now, in a practical term, a kosher kitchen. Right here? Yeah. Is that one right there? We uh, mute. Is we good? In practical terms, a kosher kitchen is going to be divided into two. Uh, very often, you'll have you'll have two sinks: one for milk and milk products, and milk dishes, and milk uh, 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 cutlery, and milk pots and pans and one for the meat variety. You'll have two sets of cutlery. You'll have two dishwashers or one, but you wouldn't use them for both. Uh, you'll have an oven, like a, let's say a toaster oven for dairy and a regular ordinary oven for, for meat. And the knives and the pots and the cooking utensils are gonna be color coded and placed in different drawers. When we lived in Israel, we only had one sink. The apartment that we rented had only one sink. So we had different inserts. So we, we treated that sink as if it was non-kosher because it's a receptacle for both milk and meat, but you would put an insert in the bottom of the sink and you'd have two of them, one for milk and one for meat. Okay, so there are many other interesting laws that we could talk about briefly. Uh, the milk of a dead animal. What do you do if you slaughter the animal? The animal has, let's say, milk in its stomach, the milk that's found in the udder. So the udder of a, of a cow well, it's kosher meat, but it's drenched in milk. Talmud says that might be an exception. That might be the only kosher way you can have milk and meat is if you consume from the udder, the milk of the udder of a cow. And in fact, there's a very interesting Talmudic piece that says that there's a kosher outlet for every bad habit. You want milk and meat? There's a kosher variety of it. Eat from the udder. You want to taste pork? Well, apparently there is a fish called the shibuta fish. And the head of the shibuta fish tastes indistinguishable from pork. And therefore, if you want it, go knock yourself out. There is a kosher version of every bad habit. Now, over the years, I've gotten a lot of complaints about milk and meat. Rabbi, milk and meat, why is it so, there's so many rabbinic restrictions. The Torah says don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. And somehow we have to have like two separate lives, two separate identities, two separate kitchens, two separate universes. And of course I'm exaggerating, but people are bothered by all the rabbinic extensions to the core Torah law. And I think there's a, a way to think about this that makes uh, the entire subject more understandable. Suppose you viewed a violation of Torah as like a, an accident in a nuclear facility. Or better yet, a BSL-4, a biosafety level 4 
place where they study viruses. Suppose you viewed a violation of the Torah with such severity. What kind of ordinances, what kind of safety measures are being placed to prevent these kinds of accidents? Obviously, you know, you try, you try going to visit a nuclear facility, see how different layers of security there are before you get to the reactor, before you get to the centrifuge. Why? Because an accident here is very disastrous. It's devastating. It has all kinds of global consequences. I think the reason why the sages here and elsewhere, the reason why they added so many extensions to the core prohibition is because they viewed a violation of Torah with grave severity. And as a result, they added any kind of potential concern that could potentially yield to an encroachment upon the sacrosanct law, they're going to make a restriction. And the reason why it's hard, it's hard for us to understand that right, we're really going to get mixed up between a turkey burger and a meat burger, how often will that happen? How often will that happen? Even if it happens once every million instances, for the sages who viewed the Torah with such importance and such harsh severity, or at least viewed the violation of the will of God with such seriousness, they're not willing to take even that. Chance. I think it's a, it's a nice framework to understand the rabbis and their modus operandi of how they dealt with potential encroachments upon Torah law. So let's get to the other aspect of this mitzvah that um, I want to ponder, and that is the reason for this mitzvah. And again, we always say the ultimate reason for any mitzvah is because that is the will of God. Nevertheless, we try to understand a little bit about you know, how we can make sense, how we can process logically a given mitzvah. So the Sefer HaChinach, in the book that we are using to navigate through the mitzvahs, he says, and he kind of even explicitly mentions, that there seems to be some Kabbalistic undertones to this idea. And to fully understand it, you really need to go to the Kabbalistic literature but he says that this is an example of an unnatural combination. He doesn't really elaborate what that means, but the milk and the meat cannot be connected because there's something problematic about this union. It doesn't explain really what that is, but that would explain why even if you're not going to consume it, just the mixture itself just the cooking of this itself is problematic. And he quotes the Rambam. He's not a fan of this idea. He says, the Rambam says, that this was an idolatrous practice. The idol worshippers would always mix the milk and meat, and therefore as, an, as a way to kind of distance us from anything even tangentially related to the idol worshippers, the Torah prohibited the mixture of milk and meat. The Ramban he says something that makes a little bit more sense to us. He says that all milk, well, it comes from, from animals. And all meat, it also comes from animals. And therefore, there's an element of cruelty for us to use the liquid that comes from animals to kill and to cook the animal itself. And therefore, as a way to distancing us from Cruelty, the Torah says, don't use the byproduct of an animal to process and to cook that said animal. A nice idea that makes a little bit more sense to us. And then there's Rabbeinu Bechaya. He says, listen to this. He says that milk comes from blood. It's processed through the animal and it turns into milk. But consumption of blood is likely to lead that person, the person who consumes it, into cruelty. And the milk reverts back to blood when it's mixed with meat. And therefore, if you're going to consume milk and meat, the milk part of that concoction is going to be or have the quality of blood in that it's going to make you more cruel. And therefore, 
That's his reason why we should avoid it. But ultimately, as we mentioned earlier, the real reason is because that's what God decreed upon us. I had a friend who told me that there are enzymes. I don't remember the details of what he said. Something to the effect of there, were, there are enzymes that are needed to digest meat. And when you add milk to that, the milk is not properly digested. And therefore, it's unhealthy for you to have meat and then milk, but vice versa, it's not a problem. So I don't know if that's true or not, but regardless, even if it was true, it's probably a result of the law, not the cause of the law. Meaning the Torah precedes the world, and therefore if you find that a given Torah law is actually better for your health, it's most likely the result of the Torah, not the cause of the Torah, because again, the Torah preceded the world. So that's the mitzvah in a nutshell. Mixing milk and meat, we don't do it, we don't cook it, we don't consume it, and we don't derive any benefit from it. As always, my address is rabbiwalbajima.com.